And there's a lot of people in the world that will, you know, will use, will will take advantage, you know, of that person, you know, and at that age, you're easily influenced, extremely easily. I was so easily influenced. Maybe I behave in a certain way or I do certain things. Now I actually understand, you know, why. And so I think that was a, you know, a big, a good revelation for me. Basically what ended up happening was um, I was groomed and drugged and, and sexually abused by him. Um, oh what and, happened? And so that happened on multiple occasions. And so I was just completely out of it and then woke up on the side of the road, had been dumped in uh, a service station. So I woke up, she's next to me. She's like going just crazy, like, you know, saying what had happened, telling me what had happened. You know, he was he was a gangster at the end, you know, at the end of the day. And he's, he's someone, you know, who has a lot of power. I pressed the self-destruct button inside. Even though I didn't want to admit that it had actually happened, I knew deep down what it had happened and I lost my confidence. You know, I lost my self-esteem. I lost my manhood, you know, my dignity. I just needed to escape because it was like painful. Like it was, you know, deeply traumatic. I, I could like feel his hand, like hands on me and like, I had, I had to get away somehow, like mentally and emotionally. You know, my, my, my heroin addiction had got, got, gotten worse. Um, and then I started like stealing like bags and like just dip people, things off people, small and weak and vulnerable. And I hadn't had a day sober since the abuse. Since the first time I was abused, I hadn't had a day sober. You know, God's using my darkness from yesterday to make other people's tomorrow brighter. So today we've got James Crystal, recommended to me by my dad, actually. He saw James in the news, he's been doing some podcasts, and he's out in the schools. So it is a hard-hitting story involving incarceration and crime. But even today, James has been at a school this morning. He's speaking to the government. He's out there trying to make positive changes in the world. And now we're going to get go on a journey with him and see mm. what he's what he's been through. <laughs> let's go back to the start then. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So where were you born? I was born down in Hertfordshire. Yeah. Yeah. So, I uh, so yeah, that's where I grew up. Um, to be honest, I had a I had a good upbringing. Um, I had amazing parents. I still have amazing parents. You know, I love me. Um, I think for me growing up, I always felt very misunderstood. I never quite felt like I fit in um, with people. When did you first notice that? I was I was pretty young. I was pretty young. Yeah, it was just I always had a sense of adventure about me that I feel like a lot of other people didn't have. And I feel like, <laughs> you know, especially like people who, you know, who, who were supposed to be like looking after me and, you know, teachers and stuff. We just didn't see eye to eye with that, you know, and I feel like to some degree, it to some degree they should have tried harder to try and understand me, you know. Um, but I, I think, it, you know, for me, it was just getting in a lot of trouble, you know, throughout school. Um, and obviously no one enjoys getting in trouble, especially when you don't feel like you've necessarily done anything wrong. What sort of things were you doing? Do you, uh, do you know, the, my sister t <laughs> my sister told me a funny story the other day. And this is, I think this is when I was in nursery, right? So this, I wouldn't cl class this as being naughty, right? Basically, you know, in like nursery, you've got like, uh, like everyone's lunch boxes and they like put them in like post box sort of situation. And apparently I went and like just muddled them all up, just twisted them all, you know, just, just to kind of just have a little bit of fun. And apparently the teachers like went skits, like apparently they really weren't happy about it. So it was things like that where for me, it's like, oh, this would be a laugh, like just switch them around, you know? And so that was an example from obviously when I'm like three or four in nursery. And then I think just throughout, I feel like when I was told, you know, not to press a button or whatever. I'd be like, well, what? I want to 
press it. No, I want to press it. Do you know what I mean? Like, what, what's he going to do if I press it? Like, the other day, I walked out of TK Maxx with some glasses, you know, the bought like three glasses uh, in a pack. She was like, bought them and the lady said, look, just don't twist them, like turn, like twist, turn them over because they'll fall out. So I'm walking back to the car and I'm just like, twisting them. Do you know what I mean? Just to, <laughs> just to see if they will fall out or not. Because like, you need to make mistakes for yourself in life. You so know, like, you definitely had a bit of a rebellious streak. Yeah, just a little bit of a rebellious streak. Just, I just think I just wanted to have fun and explore and be adventurous, you know? Did you click up with some fellow rebels at a young age or were you a lone wolf? I feel like I was quite alone, to be honest. Was you? Yeah, I feel, well, to start, I mean, we're talking like really young. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel, I just felt, like I said, that I didn't feel like anyone un quite understood me. Like, this, not just like teachers and you know people that were supposed to be like in authority but you know maybe like my friends as well I just felt different from them um you know and so it wasn't until uh you know I was 15 and um I was diagnosed with ADHD and that was when I realized you know actually yeah maybe I am slightly like different and this is the reason like there's actually you know a reason for the way that I feel like, you know, the way I feel and the reason that maybe I behave in a certain way or I do certain things, now I actually understand, you know, why. And so I think that was a, you know, a big, a good revelation for me. Um, yeah, it was helpful. So that was a relief. Yeah, for sure. Well, it yeah. must have been lonely before that, was Yeah, it? did you have any siblings? Yeah, two siblings, yeah, two yeah. Old, elder sisters, yeah, amazing sisters. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, but I mean, just, it, it, yeah, they're, they're incredible. But yeah, again, just like, like my parents are, like fantastic, like they're brilliant and they just love me so much. But, um, you know, and they raised us all exactly the same. And maybe the way that they, the way that they raised me, maybe in hindsight needed to be slightly different from the way that my sisters, you know, were, were, were raised because, because we're different people. Does that make sense? Mm. Um, you know, my parent, my parents are, you know, fantastic. And my sisters, they've always just stood by me and loved me even when, you know, I was, you know, messing everything up in my life. Being a little shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about having a career goal then as a teenager? Did you have a plan? I feel like I was kind of like quite inspired by like people who are making money. Um, you know, I so say in school I was always like that kid that was like buying like big packs of sweets, you know, and breaking them down and selling them. You know, I got a fake ID. As soon as I could get a fake ID, I got a fake ID, and I was like buying big packs of cigarettes and you know selling them fifty p each. And so I've always been quite <laughs> entrepreneurial, yeah. um, you know. And then just like charging people like a pound to get them a bottle of drink or you know a, a packet of cigarettes. And then I realised that I could just steal the sweets rather than buying them. And then I'd just be like sweeping the shelf off into my rucksack and then <laughs> selling them on. It was just little things like that. Um, but I feel like I don't know in terms of a career goal. I feel like maybe I've just always been quite entrepreneurial. Um, and I never, never necessarily had any, any aspirations, I don't think, in terms of a career. Yeah. Yeah, wow. <laughs> what led to your first brush with the law? Mm. Um, I think it was shoplifting my first ever one, to be honest. Yeah, I think it had just like gone and just, because it was so easy like back then to just like, like I said, like you could literally just sweep a whole shelf into your rucksack, like literally. And uh, and then for my age, and I'd be able to go and sell all that, you know, make a hundred quid. And I felt, I felt like a baller, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> hundred quid's a lot of money when you're that age. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was probably like my first ever, um, yeah, that was my first encounter. Was How it did you an get arrest? Caught? Huh? How did you get caught? Yeah. I can't even remember. I think my I think my friend actually got a call, mm. and then they caught me at the same time. Yeah. Did they grass? Nah, but it was just I can't exactly remember. But I think my friend got caught, and then I think just because I was with him, um, I ended up getting done as well, and they searched me. Did they take you to the station? Yeah. 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 What Talks about when your mum and dad got informed? How did that feel? Yeah, I. Yeah, it was kind of scary. <laughs> I just did everything that I could to try and avoid um, my mum and dad finding out about stuff. But when you're at that age, you have to have a, like a, what do they call it? A responsible adult, is it? Pick you up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think for me, I probably just didn't want to like let my parents down, you know. Um, what was it like when they showed up? Um, 
it's probably just quite a lot of shame, even though they probably wouldn't have wanted me to feel that way. Just a lot of shame. Um, so did, and, did you get chucked in the cells? Yeah, I did actually, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What was that like? Well, the first time, I yeah. can't really remember, to be honest. I, honestly, it was so long ago. I, in terms of the police cells, I feel like you know it, there's an expiration date on it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know... If if you're living if you're living that lifestyle, you know that you're going to be in there for 24 hours, or you know maybe they might apply for an extra 12 hours, or you might get bailed. But when it's something like you know shoplifting or like possession with a small amount of drugs, you know you're probably going to be out within 24 hours. So it's not, you know, it's not it's transient, isn't it? It's not a permanent fixture. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really remember. I do, I, I do think I was pretty scared. I mean, especially when like they'd start like searching you, and you know you've got something, mm -hmm. something on you. Um, but yeah, I mean, we used to have quite a lot of fun, fun with the with the police as well. You know, like running and hiding, and it just, it, I, I feel like because I was quite young, it just felt like a game, doesn't it? it feels like a, yeah, you know, and and to some degree, it's not, it's not massively serious. You know, it 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 might be a bit fun. And then you start getting older and, you know, you've got more responsibility and it starts to get, you know, the punishment starts to get more severe, right? Did you promise your parents you wouldn't do that again? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. think, is it? I, <laughs> you usually do. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. Can you remember your second arrest? Um, I think it was possession of drugs. Weed? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. How did you get caught? Um, gosh, it was, I think we were just like down the town park smoking weed, um, and then just like ran, um, like a long way, just ran, got chased and then the police caught us. Did they have dogs? No, there was no, no. dogs. No, no, no. So these like arrests at these young ages, are they just giving you a warning, the cops? Yeah, just like reprimands and like final warnings and stuff like Cautions. that. Cautions. Yeah. yeah. Did your parents have to get involved in that one? Um... I think so, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So you were fifteen at this point? Um sixteen now. Sixteen. Wow. Yeah. So I'd been kicked out of school at this point. Um For what? I came in stoned. What? Yeah, I came in. I was high. And what the teacher noticed? Yeah, well I went out on my lunch break. I just yeah. 'cause you're not allowed to like necessarily leave on the lunch. So I went out on the lunch and I came back in and I was just like baked. I hadn't really smoked much weed at this stage. And the, the the, the, the mate that I smoked it with like rolled a like a big spliff and I smoked it and I was really like baked <laughs> and then just came back in um and then the way the way it was like where I had to come back in I had to go like behind where my form tutor my form like class was form room and then my form tutor saw me and uh yeah and, and just like opened the fire escape and she was like James um and I was just so high I was really high, too high um, and then she took, they just, they actually got someone to escort me to the, uh, like the head, not, not the headmaster, but the head of like sick form, I think it was, even though I wasn't in sick form. Um, and, uh, apparently someone had to like carry me up the stairs. So, yeah. And then, and then they just kicked me out straight away. Wow. Mm. Did you plan to go to college after that? Did I plan to? I, I don't know if I'd necessarily made too many plans. Um, yeah, I don't remember having like plans at that stage. How were you? Didn't, in... it, Sorry, go. I was just going to say, like, it didn't. I don't think the answer is kicking people out of school, you know, necessarily, or kicking people out of class, you know. And I think to some degree that's the easy, the easy option, mm. you know, for a teacher to do if someone's disrupting the class or, uh, you know, they don't know how to deal with them, you know, deal with their emotions. Often it's just easier to just kick them out, get rid of them. I don't think that's the right thing to be doing, you know, because ultimately what happened is when you push, when you, when you push someone out of that, you know, safe, safe environment, you're pushing them out into the world. And there's a lot of people in the world that will, you know, will use, will, will take advantage, you know, of that person, you know, and at that age, you're easily influenced, extremely easily. I was so easily influenced, you know, and, and then I started hanging around with people that, you know, I probably shouldn't have been hanging around with. Oh. How were you introduced to weed? I think it was just a transition from like starting like smoking cigarettes. Um, I think it's the same probably with most people to be honest. Like it was just like cigarettes and then 
smoking like and then like drinking and then you know it, the, the 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 leap from like nothing to a spliff is not as big as the leap from just like a fag to a, a spliff right right and so i feel like someone just offered it to me and like i said i never 100 percent understood the emotions that i was feeling i never 100 percent felt like i fit in you know to the people around me you know into my surroundings i felt different to other people and so you know when someone you know when i was offered when i was offered that and i tried it i was able to skate i was able, able to escape you know um how i felt and yeah. and you know i guess it gave me to some degree some peace um you know from the difficult emotions that i was feeling before uh so yeah so someone someone had offered it to me and i think yeah i think it just kind of calmed me down quite a lot um yeah so getting kicked out of school what did you go on to next so after that it was uh I, st I started like um selling weed um to kind of you know feed my habits and you know finance my lifestyle um and then do you remember the methadone for the mcat yes remember that? yeah they used to sell it in sex shops didn't they did they yeah <laughs> yeah, that's, that's such a random reference. How do you know? Yeah. <laughs> Say nothing. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, it used to be legal. It was a legal high. Yeah, it was a legal high, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to call it like plant food, do you remember? Yeah, yeah, that's how they got away with yeah. it. It's yeah, ridiculous. like plant fertilizer and stuff. <laughs> so I had a friend who was, um, a friend's brother who was uh, studied chemistry at Cambridge. And then he basically did, like designed the, the formula well, not the, but a formula for methadone. So he um, was cooking it up. So he was, yes, yeah, so, but he 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 made um, he set up like a lab, like a more like a factory, to be honest. It was legal, right? So, and he had uh, you could go to Cambridge, you could ring this oh eight hundred free number off a payphone, and someone would just come and deliver it on a bike, just like this, just exactly the same as you get Uber Eats now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was cheap and because i you know i had the and i kind of i knew him through my friend i was getting it just super cheap um like a pound a gram what selling it on for 20 pound a gram um at, you know 0. 0.7 or whatever and um and yeah so i obviously started like selling that and making you know some you know money which is you know a decent amount of money for my age um but then i was using it as well they say you shouldn't it, use it. You know, mm. you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use um, your supplier. And yeah, I think I've always had a very addictive personality. I think maybe I still have to some degree, but I've just channeled it differently now. Um, you know, and then it was just kind of raving and, you know, lots of parties and, um, and that was, that was just the lifestyle that I was living at that time in time of my life. And how old were you at this point? So at this point, I'm um, like, yeah, 16, 17 still. Yeah. Um, and then things started to go downhill. Um, so I, some of the people that I was hanging around with, there was some, some older, older guys as well. Um, and then there was one guy who was like 40. Must be old. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Mm. But it didn't seem weird for some reason. Right, because I feel like when you're under the influence of drugs, your perspective on life is just so, uh, just so like augmented, you know. You're the, and basically, what ended up happening was um, I was groomed and drugged and and sexually abused by him. Um, oh what and, happened? And so that happened on multiple occasions. Are we able to talk about it? Well, I'd, I mean, I won't go into huge detail because. I don't feel like I need to, um, but the first time uh, we we'd been in London, um, and basically we drove. We were driving back. He was driving, um, and I I just I'd passed out. I'd been drugged. Um, I mean, I was taking like drinking and using already, but I'd taken some in. You know, I'd been drugged, and you know, um, and so I was just completely out of it, and then woke up on the side of the road. Had been dumped in uh, a service station 
with my and my my girlfriend at the time was in the car as well. So I woke up, she's next to me, she's like going just crazy, like, you know, saying what had happened, telling me what had happened. Um and that was the that was the first, you know, um the time that something had happened like where he'd sexually abused me, but you know, I didn't want to believe it. I mean, so like, she was unaware. Of she what was in the back, no, she witnessed it all. He was threatening her she witnessed in the back it? of the car, Holy yeah. Shit. Yeah. And but the the reason I don't I have to it's, I have to be the the guy was um you know he was he was a gangster at the end you know at the end of the day and he's he's someone you know who has a lot of power you know and so um you know I I, I, I try not to go too much into specifics um you know but that that was where my my life started to really go downhill you know for me. <laughs> Um, we've got um, a legal requirement so because of the nature of what you just said the police now are, are making me ask the guest the following do you waive your anonymity on what you've just said which just means you've just told us that happened and you you're okay with that um yeah i'm cool to tell you okay so you waive your anonymity <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah. thank you is that your legal requirement yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah so from there like basically I pressed the self-destruct button inside because, mm. you know, I feel like in that moment, I even though I didn't want to admit that it had actually happened, I knew deep down what it had happened and I lost my confidence. You know, I lost my self-esteem. I lost my manhood, you know, my dignity, you know, my self-respect, all of it, all of these, you know, super important things that you need, especially as a young, you know, a young anyone, you know, but as a young man, I lost all of that. Um, you know, I didn't know where, didn't really know where to turn to. But the worst thing I think was that I didn't want to accept or admit that it had happened. Um, and, and yeah, I think that was really hard, not, not knowing who to talk to or not, you know, not wanting to talk about it, you know. And so then you, Anyway, it actually happened on um, like multiple occasions, um, and obviously, I feel like subconsciously I probably didn't want to accept that it happened. But obviously, after a couple of times, you, you know, I I knew and I had to come to terms with, with what had happened. Um, and and yeah, that, I think for me that was where my life started to really go down downhill. Did that push you further into drugs to because exactly. you got all this chaos in your head. I just needed to escape because it was like painful. Like it was, you know, deeply traumatic, um, you know, and it was just like disgusting, you know, like I, I could like feel his hand, like hands on me and like, I had I had to get away somehow, like mentally and emotionally, you know, from what had happened. And so I just uh, turned even heavier uh, to drugs. Um, you know, I feel like my life started to get more erratic around that point. I actually like, lost a friend um, around the same time as well to um, to drugs, to, to the methadone. He had like a brain hemorrhage and, and died. Yes. Um, Were you there when that happened? That was before, so that was actually before the, the, the abuse, but all of this had, had happened around the same time. I wasn't like there, but I'd got a phone call um, and yeah, and it's, Ali's dead and you know, I had another friend actually, and this this was about probably about a year before the abuse. Who, you know, and I talk, I talk when I when I talk at schools, especially obviously if it's drug prevention, which is so important, I will go into quite a lot of detail about. You know, it, it's raw, it's very real, and I'll talk about the you know the people I know who have died because of drugs, um, and because I want them to understand the reality, um. And so yeah, I had another friend. Um, he was like fourteen when he died. Yeah, and he 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 went missing on um, on Christmas Eve. He went walked home, never got home, and then a search party went out and they found him. You know, the next morning in in a river, face down, dead. And and this is the reality of of you know of, of drugs and what they can do to people. You know, what do you think yeah. had happened with him? Had he just got so many drugs he'd lost his way or I think his body couldn't probably couldn't cope with with whatever he'd taken they said that in the re newspaper reports they'd said that he'd just been drinking that's what his friends had said 
you know, I know that he'd, I know that he'd done more than that um, in the days before, at least. Um, you know, even Ketamine came into play as well, Ooh. and so I think, I think ultimately his body couldn't couldn't cope with it. You, you just, you. I think one of the problems with like drug addiction is that you don't know that you have it until you know you have it. Does that make sense? Like, that's one of the big problems. Like, you don't know you have it until you try something and it's not worth taking that risk. And I feel like for Jordan, um, you know, his body just couldn't couldn't take whatever had happened. I don't know exactly. Maybe he slipped on the ice and hit his head and fell into the river. I just don't know. Um, but that was... So basically what I'm saying is there was all of this stuff had happened, you know, all of this fairly traumatic, um, these traumatic events had happened all in quite a short space of time. And then, you know, the I think with the abuse, it just kind of tipped me over the edge. Did your girlfriend, did she know the abuse had continued after that first time? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, well, she, I, no, I don't know. She, I think the second time she knew about it, um, and then I, and then there was, a, I think, three more occasions, um, and I didn't, I didn't feel like I could tell anyone about it. Because you said you were groomed. What mm. sort of things was he doing? Well, he, I mean, groomed in the sense that, you know, he would um, entice you, like feed you loads of drugs. Yeah, well, but like uh, best way of, like describing it, but like he had like nice cars, right? He had money, and you know, he was quite affluent right and so i feel like for young people and he was prolific but it wasn't just me i feel like that in that sense he kind of groomed people groomed young lads in by his lifestyle you know and then would get them on their own and you know the rest is history has he faced the consequences of that this person so for me this is and this is well, when we discussed what we discussed it, you know, before we started, like, um, so for me, he, he like threatened me and my family. He put a brick, uh, f through my parents, um, house. Um, how you know, did he justify that? Well, he didn't want me to say anything, did he? So he just put a brick through, through your yeah. parents' window. So what was this about 10 years ago, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Probably longer than, yeah, a bit longer. Yeah. yeah. But he just didn't want me to. You know, he wanted to instill fear. He, he wanted to instill fear in me, and he did. You know, he he scared me to the to you know to the point of silence to some degree. And I didn't tell anyone really about it. Excuse me. The you know, my mum and dad only found out um, a little bit a little bit further down the down the road when when my my life had completely fallen apart. Her drugs had completely taken hold of me, and my mum and dad just so confused. They'd moved away um, at this point. They'd moved a bit further up north, and they just like rang my girlfriend, and they're just like, "What? What is going on? Like, what? And we need to know what's going on." And she said, "Look, I'm gonna. I'll tell you. Come down, and I'll tell you." So yeah, they drove down, and she she basically told them, um, and I was there. You know, she told them. She you know, and she told me, you know, they need to know, um, and and yeah, like she told them what happened. Because who were you living with at this point? I was just living on my own. Living on your own? Yeah. yeah. So how did it stop then with that person? How did he, why did oh, he it went stop? to jail. He went to jail. He went to jail for something else. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think he beat his neighbour up or something. Okay. Yeah. And then that was literally how it stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Because so he actually kidnapped me at one point. What? He kidnapped me at one point. How? Came from? My, from my girlfriend's house. He, he came and he kidnapped me, put me in the back of his car. Um and and basically had him and him and his I think it was his nephew could hear they what they were talking about you know um what what they wanted to do to me and then we got probably about ten minutes up the road and I heard like the the car like slammed slammed to uh, like slammed um to, came to a stop and I heard like screeching of tires in front of the car and uh, my girlfriend's dad had 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 driven followed them up yeah what? followed them up the road to like some service stations where they'd been pulling in and like it's just keep in front of the car oh my god and start and then god started threatening him told him to let me out thank god for that yeah, yeah. christ so was there a confrontation at that point no, he got me put like he let me out of the car and then just drove off did he give you a lift home 
Oh my, the girlfriend's dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say. What, <laughs> what kind of a sentence did this person get then? Well, from, he didn't get anything to do with me. I know, but what sense did he get? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it was too long, that one, to be honest. So all this going on, <gasps> were you getting in trouble with the law at this point? Yeah, was, well, I was still, you know, so what happened with me after the abuse, um, you know, my like I said, my drug taking got, you know, more severe and someone, someone offered me some, uh, this is like brown powder, right? I said, try some, try some of this. I'll sort you out, and um, put it on like some um, like tin foil, right? So okay, he just said like, show me how to do it and everything, um, and I did it, and uh, like one of the biggest mistakes I've made, you know, because it sorted sorted the pain out. You know, it's, it like worked, um, and then the I later dragon. found yeah, out, yeah, they found out that it was it was heroin. Yeah. So you didn't know it was heroin when you took it? I didn't know it was no. when I first took it that first time. Wow. And, um, you know, from then I just, I got, I, that was it. There was no turning back. Like, it's, I obviously wouldn't recommend anyone do it. Mm -hmm. But for me, where I was craving that release and I was craving the, the numbing of the, the pain that I was experiencing, the emotional pain, it worked. You know? Self-medication. And, and, and ultimately it was a self-medicating that isn't that my problem was drugs you know my problem was always not wanting to be me drugs and alcohol followed mm. does that make sense and so you know it was all self-medication it was all self-medicating and so yeah when you know they give me some some of the some of the you know the smack um after that i was i was just hooked um and then my crime started to get more erratic um you know, and I, I don't, I never, don't tend to like talk in like too much detail, um, to be honest. But like, I got done for um, got a conspiracy to supply like cannabis. I mean, they're not pretty minor charges, to be honest. But they were like five, uh, five counts. Um, and then so this is when I'm uh, 18, and then they, uh, I went up, I went and pled guilty to that. Um, they like took my phones from me. Um, which is like basically just taking away my revenue. Um, and I went guilty to that. I got like a two year suspended sentence or something for that. How did you get caught? Oh, <laughs> it was a bit of a madness. Um, do you remember when the Tottenham riots were happening? Yeah. yeah. So yes, yeah, so it was, I'd basically been in, in arrested for, um, it was, there was some rioting that had, had happened. Um, uh, and basically got arrested for that and that they took my phones uh, from me. Um, it was actually a craziness. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so they took my took my phones and uh, they went through them. Um, and there was lots of like messages on there. And cause I don't know, like I, you, 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 when every time you reload, I'd just like send a message to the whole phone list. Mm. <laughs> and and like they just didn't clearly didn't have any brain cells in my head because the majority of the like it would just be like all right you got anything I'd be like yeah yeah mate you're here and it all be via text all of it right everything <laughs> and so they got all that um, but they never found any food they never found any any like any drugs um, and so they just had me on quite like you know those different like counts conspiracy to supply. And that was it. So, so that was two years suspended, you say? They give me like, two, I think it was a two years suspended sentence, yeah, suspended for like 18 months or something. So did that make you change your ways or did you just go back to it? <clears throat> well, the thing is, I think when, once, the problem with addiction is that you can't, you, it's, uh, you know, it's a beast, isn't it? It's, mm. uh, and especially with things like opiates, you know, and cocaine, uh, I, I couldn't get out of the, the grip, you know, addiction's grip. And, and obviously I went from a stage of having money to be able to feed my habits and finance, you know, my lifestyle to having, you know, to essentially having it all taken away from me, but still having the habits, you know. And so, you know, my, my, my heroin addiction had got, got, gotten worse. Um, and then I started like stealing like bags and, like just dip people things off people um like cash from the cash points you know stuff like that and so it just things just got more erratic does that make sense um and then they, that was when they arrested me for for that for the for, for robbery 
Um, and and that's the, I think, yeah, with, with drugs like you know opiates, it's it, you can't function without it. Like you you, it changes your your chemical makeup is completely changed and like I couldn't get out of bed without it you know I couldn't go to sleep without it I couldn't eat without it it, it was you know it was it was horrible so, um and so they ended up arresting me for 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 that are we able to talk about the robbery um I don't tend to to be no, honest no, no. no okay but then they put me away for, for yeah I went that was when I got put away all right so getting put away then first day going in what was that like yeah, that was a shock. <laughs> so, see, so like when you asked me about the police cell and I was like, well, it was all just fun and games, do you know what I mean? And then, you know, throughout my life, you know, I'd been warned about, you know, you know, if you don't, if you don't change your ways, you can end up in prison or you can end up dead by the time you're 21. That's what I used to get told by my yacht worker as well. Like that's, I remember my yacht worker actually telling me that. And it's like, well, I don't think we should be telling kids that. I don't think we should be telling anyone. I think we should be saying, actually, you've got huge potential. Like there's something, you know, you've got these gifts and these talents and these skills. And actually what you're doing, the de decisions you're making are actually, uh, you know, altering your, you know, life course. And actually we should be saying to kids, actually, you've got huge potential and you could go on to do great things. You know, but there's these things that may be getting in the way rather than saying, if you don't stop, you're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up dead because that doesn't deter people. You know, we should, we need to be championing people, lifting people up. And so I'd always been told, you know, you're going to end up in jail. And so, so I just thought, oh, cool, I'm going to end up in jail. There's no point in me changing. And if I'm going to end up in jail anyway, like you basically prophesying over me, I'm going to end up in jail. Um, and so when I landed, it was like, yeah, it was a shock to the system. I mean, I, I was like, I went in an, a complete addict. You know, I was skinny and I was like noodly and small and weak and vulnerable. And I hadn't had a day sober since the abuse. Since the first time I was abused, I hadn't had a day sober. You know, a few hours here and there whilst I was maybe waiting to get more money or waiting to reload. But that was the first time. So I basically sobered up. Uh, and essentially like woke up in a prison cell sober. Which what prison was it? Yeah, Bedford. Was that. <laughs> Bed Bedford. Yeah. Bedford. So it was like, it's one of the oldest nicks in the jail, in the in the country. You know, super like old Victorian, you know, you've got cockroaches, you know, you've got rats, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's cold. Like, and so when you're going cold turkey, you know, you don't, I was in there with like this, when I landed this like big, big black geezer, he was like just smoking weed and obviously had, you know, he, he, he was actually, cause I was a YOI still at this stage. So he was probably the same age, same sort of age as me, but I was just like, where have I, like, where, where have I landed? There's people like shouting out the windows and banging on their doors. And then the milk, like the milk, I remember just like busting the milk open and just throwing up everywhere. Like the oh. UHT milk, disgusting, filthy. Um, so yeah, it was, and then I think, you know, like I said, one of the reasons that I didn't want to use the, one of the reasons I used drugs and I used, uh, you know, different methods of escape, escape, escapism was because I didn't want to have to think about what had happened. Right. And so when I sobered up, I suddenly had all of these memories that I'd compartmentalized, you know, coming back to haunt me. Um, and I had to suddenly face up to a lot of mistakes that I'd made, you know, people that I'd hurt, um, you know, letting my family down. And so there was a lot of shame, you know, a lot of guilt. Um, Did they know you were going to get sent down, your parents? Well, they, I mean, I got remanded straight away. So it was, I'd, no one, no one knew. Uh, no. Um, but I think it was the best thing that happened one of the best things that ever happened to me. Did you have to put a call into them and tell them then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take us through that. Yeah, oh mate, I can't remember, honestly can't remember, but there's, mm. like I say, there's, there's that window that, part of my life where I was just under the influence the whole time. Because you know, where were you remanded? Bedford. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's Bedford. Yeah, it was Bedford, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah wow. so. It's like there was a cloud in your head coming down off all this stuff and it's. It, it's, yeah. it's a difficult one, isn't it? It's, 
you know, I think what goes up always has to come back down and it just didn't come back down in the way I was expecting. You know, I think I always thought that at some point I might be able to get myself sober and sort my life out. Um, even though it seemed impossible, I thought that was probably the, the, the answer. I, you know, I never expected in a million years, even though it, despite the lifestyle I was living, I never expected it to be, you know, winding up in jail. Mm. looking at maybe a few years you know behind the door I had, so i yeah. had a soulmate who was going cold turkey and um what was that like he'd, yeah, tell he'd, me. he'd been on heroin coke and injecting heroin coke and crystal meth and um he shat his box of shorts oh wow left them in somewhere in the, I don't know, in the shower some people were complaining his hair was falling out and he was okay. sleeping with his eyes open oh creepy and he was just going out of his mind and he had like abscesses all up and down his arms like emu egg size abscesses up and yeah. down his arms so my, my question is then you're cold, going cold turkey right in there uh, but you, you, you are you going to try and score first are you going to try and like you set your cell, sort yourself out i never tried to score you never that was the never, shock you needed was it i never tried to score in in prison because you said your cellmate was smoking weed. Did you not find a puff of his? Yeah, I think I smoked a bit of weed and stuff. Yeah, but I was, when you say Scott, yeah, so I never tried to like get any like class A's or anything like that. What made you make that decision then if, if you were so addicted? Because most well, people most up, people continue down that road, don't when they? When I got locked up, I didn't have any money. Mm. I didn't, probably didn't have any way of, I, well, I didn't have any way of like getting anything anyway. So maybe that was the reason why initially. Um, and I wasn't wise to, to, to prison because I'd never been in there. So I didn't know how to like trade in there. I didn't know how to make money. Um, and so that was probably why I didn't initially. And then obviously I got sober. Um, and yeah, and I think, you know, as I sobered up and as all the drugs got out of my system, uh, I guess it was, I just didn't want to go back. You know, I didn't want to. So were you done at that point with the hard drugs? Um, yeah, just well, not a hundred percent, not a hundred percent. What was it like, cold turkey? How long did that go on for? Honestly, probably one of the worst experiences of my life. Uh, it was, um, and I didn't. They offered me like methadone and and Subutex, and I declined it all. I mean, I wasn't injecting, so people that are injecting would would get some like methadone, uh, and I and I I probably should have had something, some Subutex or whatever. Cause I, I, you know, I had like a 40, 50, 60 pound at least like daily habit. That was what I needed to get through the day. And then anything else might actually get me high. Um, and so I need, needed something, but I just refused it. And I think that was actually, I feel, I believe that that was like God, like, you know, uh, influencing my decision. Cause if I had said yes, I would have spent the rest of my, maybe the rest of my life, but at least the rest mm -hmm. of my sentence on, you know, some, some sort of opiate, some sort of replacement, you know, and, and the pharmaceutical industry don't make these drugs for people to come off of them. <laughs> you know, it's just like you're just replacing one drug with the other drug. And so, yeah, so I think that was, you know, I'm proud of that decision I made because I would have had to go cold turkey at some point. Just do it, why not just do it at the beginning? So did you have the shakes? It was horrible. To sleep. Couldn't sleep. I was like tossing and turning the, the geezer um, in, Below me was just getting so pissed off. Oh. We didn't he, we didn't scrap or anything, but I, he, he was just getting so pissed off. And I had obviously when you go in, they give you like a pouch of backy, um, and so I was just like smoking nonstop. It was like the only thing I had. I'd be like smoking like all through the night, and he'd just. I remember one time just got up and started going sick like crazy because of like the smell of the smoke and stuff. Mm. Like in the middle of the night, and woke him up and. So I was just like on eggshells the whole time, really. But it was, I was throwing up. Um, I couldn't eat. Um, like you get the sweats, like really like cold sweats. Um, it's pretty nasty, to be honest. Sounds it. Like it's like, if you think about like the worst flu you've ever had and then like times it by like 10, maybe more, but then the other thing is you just can't, like you can't sit still, you can't get comfortable. So you can't just, you can't just think, oh, I just like sleep it out or just like, you know, lie down and just like rest it out. You you can't get comfy. It's a very hard thing to to explain. But like for now, I could like lie on the floor for half an hour and just be super zen and super chill. You can't do that when you're when you're trying to come off of, off of opiates. 
when we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed, and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to the customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. And the energy balls are delicious. Oh, they're my favourite, the salted pistachio. Ooh. Um, can't wait to have this this morning. Let's see what this one tastes like. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Their bulk packaging allow them to offer their customers high quality products at a fair price. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Um, so it was it was pretty nasty. Um, I reckon it lasted a couple of weeks, but then, you know, going, getting let out, you know, on the wing and stuff, you know, when I was just like, you know, super weak. And I, ne I was very lucky and, you know, fortunate. I never, you know, I never got in any trouble. Um, I just kept myself to myself. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I did feel very vulnerable, you know, coming off of the drugs. What sort of trouble did you see when you were there? In jail. Because uh, you said you weren't, you kept yourself out of trouble. Did you see yeah, much? Yeah, to start with, I definitely did. Um, there was some, I mean, there was quite a lot of craziness, like, uh, as you know, like, um, throughout, um, just trying to think, like, I mean, in Glen, I was in Glen Parva for a bit, I mentioned before, that's a Young Offenders Institute. So I, I actually went to about five prisons on on my on the on the whilst I was there. Um, went on a bit of a tour because I was on remand for quite a long time, so they kept moving me from like Pete, uh, Bedford to like the Glen Parva in Leicester, and back to Bedford, and then I'd go to court, and then like back to Glen Parva, and then I'd have to go to court. So it was just one of those. Um, but Glen Parva was just like you know the the alarms were just going off nonstop, hundred percent of the time. Um, you know, I just saw quite a lot of people get stabbed, you know, with pencils and various different things. And it was just like fighting nonstop in there. But I was always protected. I always felt like I had like, I believe that God was protecting me. Mm. But I also, you know, when I sobered up, I started hitting the gym and started exercising. I channeled my addictions into something different. You know, I was training in my cell. I was Anytime I could get out, I was doing like pull-ups on the stairs. You know, I had the, um, you know, the pillowcases full of like, I'd get like six two litre bottles of water in a pillowcase, get two of them broomstick, you know, doing my <laughs> arms, shoulders. So I was just smashing it and just doing, just training nonstop. And I actually got, you know, pretty big. Um, and so that was how I, that was probably really how I got through you know, my time. Um, you know, later on, there was some madness in Winston Green. I'll tell you about that in a, in a bit when we get there, if you want, when we get <laughs> yes, to that please. part of my story. Um, but yeah, that you know, the the time, I feel like coming off the drugs, it, so there was one aspect of it where my, you know, my mental health started to suffer. You know, I was diagnosed with PTSD and depression um, and they put me on medication, you know, and the doctor would say, oh, you know, there's this medication, but it might make you drowsy. And I was like, flipping it give me that, do you know what I mean? Give me that right now, like I need that. Um, and so I was, I probably I probably did need the medication, but I was, I was very quick to accept it. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I all I'd known was being under the influence of something and that was my way of escaping and dealing with my pain. And so when they offered me, uh, you know, a drug, which is what, it, you know, a drug which was gonna do that, I was very quick to accept. Um, and so, so there was that aspect, but then sobering up, I feel like I probably actually had the best quality of life I'd had for quite a long time <laughs> in jail. Does that make, I yeah. don't know if that would make any sense to, to anyone, but yeah, like I wasn't constantly looking over my shoulder. I wasn't constantly hurting, you know, people around me. Um, you know, and and I had some purpose to the to, to my day. I had some routine. I mean, you'll you'll, you'll know, the, you know the prison prison routine. Um, I think it's actually very 
beneficial, you know, to have that because otherwise you just go stir crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I feel like having that routine, you know, I, I felt like I had things more in order inside than than in outside. on the outside, definitely. Because you talk about God, did you find religion when you were doing your recovery or? Um, I've always, it's an interesting one. I've always called myself Christian. And so I actually, when I was growing up, I went to church and a church was another one of those places where I'd get told off all of the time for like playing football or for, I, I don't know, just have, having a, having a laugh is what I thought I was doing. And it was another one of those places where I'd be getting told off all the time. And so I'd start sort of running away. And I think one of the problems we might have with like, you know, in that church space and young people is that I think if we, if we end up, if, if people can't find something they relate to in church, right? The world, the enemy, there's an enemy in the world. I believe there's an enemy. And I think the enemy will do anything he can in his power to make sure that there's something in the world, which is more attractive than in the church. Does that make sense? And so the church would, would have been a good place for me to be. Um, and so I read the Bible and I knew, you know, this about the stories, um, and I knew about the miracles, but for me, it was like, it, it was like flesh with, it was like bones without flesh. It never really took on meaning. Um, so like I said, I'd always, call, always called myself a Christian, but the only time I'd pray would be like when I got nicked, <laughs> when I ended up in jail or when I was in detention or, you Promise know, I, I went to it again, God. Did, yeah, exactly. Or if <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't want to, exactly that. I didn't, like if I didn't want my mum <laughs> to find out about something, I'd, just, that was, these were the only times that I talked to God. And a couple of times actually like I got away with stuff and I thought, oh, he's, he's cool. Like this guy, <laughs> God is like wicked. Like he's on my side, but he is on my side, but not in that way. But, um, so that was the only time I'd like, you know, talk to, talk to God, um, and then, you know, I found my faith a little bit further on, like after I came out of prison. Um, so, so obviously like I did my sentence and then well, I did half, half of it, I did about 18 months. I was going to um, ask how long. Yes, yeah, so I did about 18 months. Yeah, yeah. I came out. Um, what was the craziness you saw in the one prison first? You oh, must... that was when I was on recall. Oh, on the oh, recall. Okay. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got released from Peterborough. Um, uh, Peterborough is like like a five star prison hotel. <laughs> yeah, they had like flat screen TVs nice. in the cells. What? Yeah, the food was amazing. <laughs> um, it was like we'd like it was just yeah it was like we just, they did like they did like ping pong competitions and then you did like the prize would be like like, like loads of big packs of sweets and chocolate for <laughs> prizes. Um, you'd have like your, like a phone in the cell. Like it was just like I couldn't believe it to be honest. We <laughs> Did you have a phone? Well, no, but it, you actually, I, you actually had like a landline, like what? that you're allowed, like in the cell to phone all your friends, yeah, to phone all your people, and unlimited calls. <laughs> Not you had to pay for them, but you know, usually you have like three minutes a day or whatever mm. it is. Yeah, you said landline in the in the. You still have to buy credits, but it's, it's it was quite new to me. Like I'd, it was like it was a private Nick Sedexo. Oh wow. So yeah, so that was crazy. Um, and I had shingles whilst I was there. I've got, can you see the scar up there on the top? Can Not a really, a, but yeah. It's very yeah. faint. Yeah, very yeah. faint. Have you had shingles? No, what My is- My dad's got it right now. Has he? After he got the thingy but that we can't talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he's got the shingles, he's painful. Yeah, he's just gone to Spain, he can't go out in the sun. Yeah, I bet. What, what's it like having him? I just had like, my skin just started itching, like, like I had a, like an, an urge to scratch it. Is it like bugs under your skin? But the, but at this, mm, I don't know about bugs, <laughs> like little creatures. No, no, no. No, but no. I I just had this urge to scratch it, but there was nothing there. But it was in agony. It felt like it was on fire, but you couldn't see anything, and it was all my hairline, um, and then like some of my face as well. And so I told the I'd actually been down the block at this. I was in the block in Bedford. And I'd smashed up my, I'd smashed up the cell because I wanted to get from Bedford to Peterborough, right? So then they put me in the, they put me in the block in, in, in Peterborough when I got there, put me back on the wing. And as soon as I got back to the wing, I started getting this pain. And so I'd said to the officer, I said, listen, I'm in agony, like my face, like it's proper agony, but they just thought I was playing up because it had come to the end of a soche. 
and they probably just thought oh, he's just pissing about he doesn't want to go in his cell and so I was saying to them like I'm actually in like at so much pain I need to see a nurse because I was in agony and they were like nah mate you're not seeing anyone tonight you just get behind your door as they do and I just said well I'm, I'm not going behind my door mate like I'm seeing a nurse and like that's final I'm not going behind my door and so they obviously they, they give you a warning and then they put an alarm on and they all come in and they twist you up and then they sent me down the seg because once you get to the seg, they have to bring a doctor to see you, right? You get a doctor a visit once a day and you'll get like a chaplain visit once a day. And so then the doctor had to come and see me and they didn't diagnose it straight away. And I had like a, um, a visit the next day with my dad, like a, a visit. They let me see him. My dad was like, oh, maybe it's shingles. <laughs> So, my, so I went back to the doctor and I said, oh, my dad reckons it might be shingles. And he looked into it. And by this point, this, it had started, it was like oh. visible. It was like a just a scab, like it was an open wound. It was a very hard one to describe. Um, and then they, he said, yeah, no, you have got shingles. Um, and then they moved me from like the seg to the hospital wing and then put me on these drugs. Um, and yeah, but there was there was one of the geezer um who was like feeding the feeding us when we were in the hospital wing found out he'd like raped a three year old. Oh and so I think obviously that's sick, like beyond sick, but I think knowing that he was out there, I wasn't allowed out and about, but knowing that he was out there just brought a lot of stuff back up for me. Um so and that was quite difficult. And they I didn't have a TV, they gave me a radio because obviously I was on basic. Um, and I was just, I had this like open wound on my face, on my hairline. And I'm like, and it was just like, honestly, it was so painful. It really was so painful. And even the weird thing is when I like, uh, push it now, you I can still feel like when I get my nail in it now, I can still feel the same sort of pain that I ha had all those years ago. Oh, wow. A weird one. What's the hospital wing like? It's just full of creeps to be honest. And, and you know, people who are unwell, but, um, you know, that orderly guy, you know, what I heard, whether it be true or not, you know, it's sick. The hospital wing was just, just like another, another wing really, but with, with doctors. And creeps. <laughs> yeah, and creeps. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, but yeah, anyway, so now we got onto that. How did we get onto shingles? <laughs> so this is towards the end of your first that, incarceration. Yeah, yeah Peterborough. Mm. So then you're getting released. Yeah. What's your plan? have time, by the way. What's the yeah, we're fine. We're out of time. Bro. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, I've got dry lips. I've got dry lips as no. well. Do you, want, do you want a bit of this? No, no. no. I, 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 I usually do carry something, but anyway. Um, so that was Peterborough. Mm. I got out of out of Peterborough um, in, it, I think it was like three days after my birthday, mm. like 18th of <laughs> August, um, 2015. Um, and I moved, I moved from uh, up to the top to the West Midlands, right? Um, to try and get a fresh start. My mum and dad picked me up from the prison, took me up, got me some food and stuff. And I think it was pretty depressing, to be honest, coming out of jail. You have your hopes set on this date, right? And it's like, yeah, this date, and it's going to be amazing, and I'll get my life back. And and then for me, you know, I got out and I had nothing. You know, I got given like £40, and, you know, I went I went and... I was put in a, a rehab center, like a rehab house, a rehabilitation house. Um, but it was, it was just depressing. You know, it kind of, that was really when the penny dropped that I've got nothing going for me, you know, mm. at least in jail, I had some purpose every day, you know, and I'd been wheeling and dealing and making like a little bit of, you know, I had like my nice pile of snacks and like shower gels and, you know, I had my TV and my routine and, and, and it felt, you know, to some degree comfortable, but when I got out, it was just like, I, I'm like so poor and I've got nothing. And, you know, it was just pretty depressing to be honest, coming out. Wow. Yeah. So you said you were in a rehabilitation house. What yeah. was that like? They put me in the, the, I went into this rehabilitation house. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of, kind of crap. Cause I was on this curfew. Yeah. I had to be like, it was like 7 PM to 7 AM. But it wasn't a probation curfew. It was just uh, like part of the rules of being in that rehabilitation house. 
Like I thought it would be the safe. It was my choice to go in there. Like I thought it would be the safest option for me with my history with addiction, coming out and going in somewhere where actually uh, there, you know, there would be some rules in place and I'd be able to be tested. And I just thought it would help me uh, transition in, you know, in in back into, um, you know, back into society. Um, but I just wanted to have sex. Like that was just, <laughs> I'd been in jail for so long and I just couldn't, I just, I was struggling to, um, it was just one of those things where it was easier at night, you know, to, to meet people. And, and so I just ended up breaking the curfew. Um, and then, and then <laughs> to go have sex <laughs> and a couple of weeks, a couple, it was about two months, I think in, they, they caught me coming back one morning about, I came back about 5am to try and obviously get in before they came back to the house. And then they just, they basically just, you know, found me, uh, caught me coming back in and just kicked me out. It was like one strike policy. Oh. And so it was, that kind of sucked. So had, you, had you lost your girlfriend by this point then? Yeah, no, I was completely single, singular. Did you find the abuse mucked with your sex life? Yeah, I think for me, it just, I lost, like I said at the beginning, I lost my self-respect. You know, I didn't have any respect for me or my body. You know, so I think from that perspective, yeah, I, you know, I just, I felt like I was damaged goods, you know, so I, you know, I just think, you know, I wasn't too, it, I, you know, to sex didn't bother me or anything like that. It was just, I feel like I'd lost respect for myself already. So I don't know. I don't know if I've never really tried to kind of verbalize any of that, but I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's what happens when someone abuses you, you know, they abuse your body. Um, yeah. And what, your mind. what was the next temptation then? <coughs> um, I'm going to grab some, some water. Of course. Um, the next temptation. Oh, when I got kicked out of the rehab, I just got, I just started drinking again. And um, I think I took some speed. I think some speed was like the first drug I took. Some Where proper, were you living? Proper random. I, I moved up. in with this a girl that I'd, that I'd met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the one you got kicked out for? Yeah, basically. Oh, yeah, Exactly, wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, How'd you, you met her? Telling my story better than me. What? How'd you <laughs> met her? Oh, I just, I, it was just <laughs> met her like at a pub, you know. On the pole. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. I used to have a little bit of game. I'm, cel <laughs> <laughs> I'm celibate now, um, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, yeah. And so, I well, I had to, I had to find somewhere to live because after I got kicked out of the probation, uh, re the rehabilitation place, my probation officer said like you've got 24 hours to find yourself an address, and if you haven't got like a fixed abode, they have to send you back to jail. It's very nice that that girl to let you move in. I'm feeling nice of her, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. quickly. <laughs> yeah. It turned out she had like quite a lot of debt with someone. And then I had this like nice stone, I had this nice stone island jacket. It was like one of the, it was like the only nice thing I owned <laughs> and a nice pair of shoes. They were like the only two, my two nicest belongings. And it was like yellow. It was bright yellow. It was a nice jacket. I probably got a picture somewhere. And I had this silver, this fake, big fake silver <laughs> chain. I don't know who I thought I was. Mr. T. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. And um, but it turned out she owed some boys some quite a lot of money, um, for whatever reason. Drug debt. I I, don't, I think it, I think it must have been, but it was it was all a bit hazy. <clears throat> and they basically they'd seen me walking around with this jacket on. I mean, it was like five hundred pound jacket, but like what? I, <clears throat> they came and basically started shooting through the top of the door. What? Yeah, and they, they were like fourteen, fifteen year old kids. Yeah, <clears throat> and there was just like a gang of them and they came shoot, shoot through the door. They actually kicked the door down. They came in and they robbed me of my jacket Aww. and my um, <clears throat> and my fake silver chain, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> 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 uh, but I was gutted. So that was that was a bit crazy because they were like, they were, they were just like kids. Wow. <clears throat> Bachetes and I don't know if the guns were real guns. I feel like they might have been, you know, the, the air guns, you know, the two twos. Mm. They look very real and they sound real and they would, would probably hurt big time if you got shot in the head but <clears throat> so that happened um and then from there i uh, i went into a probation hostel um which was like the least inspiring and most depressing place i've ever been in my life how so i was just f 
I was surrounded by people that I like. I was just surrounded. There was a lot of homeless people in there, a lot of people that were just like really addicted to drugs and had been for a long time. You know, it was just, it was just a, a there was just no hope in there, to be honest. You know, there was just no hope. Um, yeah, it was just, it was pretty, pretty dire, to be honest. And, and I'd, I'd kind of got back on drugs and stuff, nothing hard. Um, and I started using, I started kind of like wheeling and dealing a little bit, you know, nothing, nothing like, like I was before, but just to, just to kind of make a little bit, you know, um, and then one lad basically just owed me some money and I found out that he owed a load of other people money. And so I just, I threatened him. Um, and like, cause I wanted to make sure I got my money because I knew how much money he was getting and it wasn't enough to pay everyone. And then basically the next morning he, he just snitched on, on me and the other people that he owed money and they just kicked us out of the probation hostel. <sighs> and then, um, so this was all a bit of a madness because like I'd really, I was desperate to try and sort my life out. And I think this is just something that just shows how strong the addiction is, you know, um, and how, how hopeless my situation was. Um, and so around this same time, <clears throat> I think it was just before I got kicked out, actually, I found this, I found a church which had just been, uh, which had just been planted. It was a new church. And, uh, yeah, like I went in there. My dad had told me about it and he said, Oh, it's this new church. Like, why don't you try it? It was around the corner from the hostel. And, uh, I went in and, and there was just an amazing energy in there. And I must have looked like a right idiot. I had like my trousers halfway down my ass, like my hat on backwards. I probably had some sort of fake chain on. Um, and they just, they, I told them I'd just come out of jail and they just loved me. They just, they just genuinely, they just loved me and they uh, encouraged me and they wanted to support me, you know, and f and f I think for the first time, not for the first time ever, but for the first time of my own accord, I was surrounded by people who were championing me and lifting me up rather than tearing me down. <laughs> And that's when I feel like I started to get inspired. Um, and that was ultimately probably my first encounter with like the Holy Spirit, like, because there was that energy in there. There was something in there that was like drawing me back. Um, and so, you know, I, I started going there like on a kind of like a weekly basis. Um, but you know, my life was, was still going downhill, you know, there was something about it that I liked, but I was still using and I was still, you know, drinking and all of this sort of stuff. Um, and eventually I got bait recalled back to jail. <clears throat> I failed a drug test. Ah. Uh. Yeah. I failed a drug test and uh, I went, I had the drug test and then I went back to probation a week later and I, I went in and she was like, oh, um, I'm James, I'm, you failed your drug test and you're wanted for recall to prison. And I was like, oh, right. And I was like, see you later then. <laughs> just like darted out, just went on the run, went to Sainsbury's, dyed my hair blonde as you, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and that was it. I just thought, I'm going on the run. I don't want to go back to jail. Like, and, um, I think it lasted about three days to be honest. And then my conscience kicked in. Yeah. My mum called, uh, called me and just, you know, just said to me, you know, you can't be on the run, you know, run, run forever. And, um, Where were I, you hiding out? Um, I was hiding out in another um, girl's a girl's house. <laughs> <You wasn't laughs> so, yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, and so it was only a few days, and then I went and handed myself in. I kind of got parcel dark prepared, um, and it was really funny, you know. It was like I went to this police station, and I said I went there, and I said, "Look, I'm wanted for recall to prison." And the lady was like, oh, well, I'm sorry, sir, but there's no like police cells here <laughs> and there's no policemen here either. And I was like, oh, right, okay. On your way. So, yeah, <laughs> you know? I'm just thinking, what is going on? Like, I've I've come here to have myself in. Like, I just presume she'd like press a button and they'd all like, you know, run out, whatever. And she's like, yeah, you're just gonna have to sit down there for like a bit and I'll try and get someone to come and pick you up. So I was just like waiting for about two hours going like in and out, in and out for like smokes. Just the whole time thinking, do I 
do I stay? Do I go? <laughs> like knowing that I'm going back to jail, I don't know how long for. <laughs> um, but I think sometimes, I think often in 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 life, you know, the the best decisions are the hardest decisions. You know, the the hardest decisions are the right decisions. Does that make sense? Mm. And it was one of those where it was the right decision to to have myself in, but it was also the hardest decision in the moment. Because um, being as how well you came off the drugs in the first sentence did you mm. not get tempted to think actually this will sort my life out say that again going back to jail would sort your life out to stop you using did again. i think that no mm. i didn't think that no no no, no but it did you it did though it definitely yeah, yeah. did you know i think getting recalled then was definitely a lifesaver mm. you know um and so yeah i got recalled and they gave me like a release date it was about it would have been about three months and I mentioned to you before, I was in there with, there, there were quite a few people on recall. There was one guy um, who, he, he, I think his original sentence was like burglary or something. And then he'd gone into like, he'd gone into a house on, whilst he was out on license and like stolen someone's phone. But I think it was like a friend's house or something. So I wasn't 100% sure about the specifics, but he got recalled for that, basically stealing a phone. And he got a 28 day recall. So he was, he was only recalled for 28 days, but yet me for failing a drug test, it was three months. I hadn't even committed any crime, you know, so that it's just like- That doesn't I, seem fair. Well, exactly. No one ever said the system was fair, right? Mm. So that happened. They gave me this release day. The, um, I, I, the day came and I'd had my hopes pinned on this day as you do. Mm. I told my family that I was getting out. I had my bags packed. I'd given a load of stuff away to all my friends. And then the next morning I heard the screws opening doors. So I was up and about lively. I'm like, yeah, I'm going, I'm getting out. And then they just never opened my door. I was like, okay. So I put the, I put my bet my buzzer on and the screw came to my door and I said, yo, Gav, I'm gonna get out today. Like I've got the let I've got the letter here, like my release date. And he was like looking at his list and he said, you know, you're not going anywhere today. Um, he said, you're not on my list, you're not going anywhere. And I was just like depleted, you know, like yeah. I couldn't believe it. Um, and then I got out and I managed to ring my probation officer and the same one that recalled me. And I just said, look, what's going on? Look, you told me I was going to get released today. And she said, look, I'm sorry, James, but um, the Home Office have refused your release at the last minute. <gasps> Can they do that? I, you tell me. I, <laughs> I don't know. How bizarre. I don't know. She said, they've refused it at the last minute. She said, you're not going to be going anywhere today. She said, look, I'm going to come up and see you in a couple of weeks and we'll try and sort it out. And I just said, look, I, I just said, like, screw you, screw the home office in like not so polite words. Mm. I said, I don't need any of you and just like hung the phone up. Um, and then like, what's funny is like fast forwarding just quickly, I actually rang that same probation officer a couple of years ago. I've had no, I've had no need to contact her for quite a few years, but I rang her and I just felt like a, a need to apologize to her. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I feel so blessed to have been through everything that I've been through and all the experiences that I've had. I feel so blessed to have had them because it's made me who I am today and it's made me someone that I'm proud of and it's given me the ability to affect change in other people's lives. So I rang her and I explained to her how my life had been transformed and I just thanked her for sending me back to jail. I just said, look, I just wanted to thank you because it was the best thing that had ever happened to me. And what did she say? <laughs> she was just speechless. She didn't, ha she didn't know what to say. Oh. She was like, and she then eventually she said, look, James, she said, I don't know what to say. No one's ever thanked me for sending them back to jail. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, so that happened. And then even more crazy than that, like at the end of last year, I actually went and spoke at the home office. Like I went and, and I spoke to them and I, wow. and, I t and I taught them about forgiveness and the power of second chances. And I shared that exact same story with them, <laughs> you know, where they refused my release. And, and I told them, I don't hold it against you. I said, you know, it's actually it, it, in the moment I was pissed and I was angry, but looking back, it was probably the best thing that ever happened. So I said, thank you, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's, it's just crazy how things turn around, you know, mm. and it was, you know, God, God works in mysterious ways, but so that was it on the recall. And then obviously- Well, go back, uh, where were you recalled to? Where were you housed? I was, I was it was Winston Green. 
This is where the madness was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they had some madness. Wow. Did you hear about the riots? You must have heard about the Winston Green riots. What year was it? 20, uh, six, uh, 2016. End That's of 2016. Probably did at the time, yeah. They were, like the, they were the biggest prison riots since Strange Ways. Wow. In the 80s in the UK. Yeah. So it was crazy. But it happened I, while you were there? Yeah, it happened whilst I was there. Did you participate in the riot? I can't. I, I, the thing is, what I, what I won't say is that I participated. I, I can't say, you know, too much about what happened. I was out of my cell. You observed what was happening. Mm. Yeah, observed. There was just... <laughs> we hope you're enjoying the podcast. This is worth my sponsor. Jen, it's that time of the year when people are stuffing themselves with food and then the sun's not out and vitamin deficiencies occur. You said that you were on some vitamins, but you were overdosing yourself. I honestly was taking up to 10 tablets a day, not knowing if they were giving me any health benefits at all. So now finding Vital has proved absolute wonders for me. Fill in a short online consultation about your diet, health goals and lifestyle and Vital will create a tailored made pack just for you. To get a free two week trial of personalized vitamins, head to vitl.com and use the code Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at checkout. Link is in the description box below this video. So Jen, how easy is the Vital website to use? So with a few simple steps, it can tell you what you are lacking in nutrients. So for me, it was my skin, sleep, and stress. <laughs> so mm. now after four days of use, I'm already seeing an improvement. So well done, Vital. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Now back to the podcast. There was there was quite a lot of you know craziness that that went down, um, and I, I was actually um, called after I got out of jail because they happened about two weeks before the end, right at the end of my license. So after the after the rights, they moved me to um, Oakwood, and then when I got out, a few months later, the police got in contact with my with my dad somehow. My dad rang me and he said the police are looking for you, like they you're not like wanted, but they want to talk to you, and I was like. All right, okay. So I got, he gave me my number and they rang me and they just said, look, we want to, we need to interview you. Like either you come in and like we interview you or you, or we just come and arrest you. And so I went in and my, my solicitor came up from um, Hoddesdon and um, I just went no comment the whole way through because, but they wanted to interview me about the, the riots. What crazy stuff happened in these riots? I mean, it was crazy. I mean, one guy got like paralyzed from the waist from the waist down. He he got like st stabbed like hundred like hundreds of times. He I think he'd like pulled a gun out on someone on road, and that there were two right. So essentially, from my understanding, a parcel came over right into the yard. The screws got the parcel, and then started like flaunting it, saying, "Ah, we got your parcel." Da 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 da. And the ge the guys the guys weren't too happy about this, right? And so they um some someone um a couple of the, the boys stole the screws keys and they got him and, and took his keys and then went and just unlocked everyone on their wing. And then by this point, because there's so many people out, the guards are on un outnumbered, they had to retreat. But the keys weren't just for that one wing, it was for the rest of the jail as well. You understand? So they actually got off of their wing. They got into like the office, the meds hatch, like every, just every, they, they had like all access, like <laughs> access all areas, <laughs> VIP. And uh, they got off of their wing, but the problem was that they had the two, so they had, they had two L-shaped wings mm. and they had one gang on here and one gang on there. I'm not going to go into specifics about like who you know who the gangs were, but they were two big rival gangs, the biggest in the area. And so the thing is, they they had the keys to all of that area. So when they went, they went off their wing, opened the next wing, and then they went on to the other side and started opening those doors as well. And so these two gangs had always been um, separated. They never they were they'd never crossed paths, and all of a sudden. You know, some of these, you know, a lot of these guys are like doing life because of each other, you know, they're lifers and like they were all suddenly, you know, mi mi mixed. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> so it was, so there was just quite a lot of craziness. Um, I mean, the, 
everything got set on fire. Like the pool tables, like just everything. Chaos. Mm. The meds hatch, like you well, know, the meds pe got nicked. people had access to the meds hatch. <laughs> yeah. There was like a safe full of like stolen phones and like um just like, you know, things that have been um take like what's the word? You know, things that the screws have taken off. Confiscated. Confiscated, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I think something went down the wrong hole. <laughs> what about sex offenders? Did they get, get access to them? Yeah, so what happened is, um, obviously, I, <clears throat> there were some people that that was their intent, that was what they wanted to do. And the screws actually got, when they, they managed to get a padlock and padlock this one, these, these gates that were in between the two wings so that, so that no one could get through essentially. Mm. Uh, obviously they didn't have the keys to that padlock. Um, so it was just crazy. But I, I remember the one guy, um, an old, a, a lifer called Keith, a really good guy. Actually, when I, when I got, when I found out that I wasn't getting out, I started like losing it <clears throat> and I've really lost it with one of the officers and Keith, this geezer, this life, a big dude came, put his arm around me and just like walked off of me, not aggressively, but like firmly, took me to his cell, <clears throat> sat me down and he just said, look, James, he said, I've been in here 33 years. He said, he said, listen, son, I go up for parole every single year and get turned down. He's like, how long you got left of your license? And I was like, like six months, <laughs> you know? And he's like, and he so he shared with me his, his, you know, his reality and helped me to see it from a different perspective, you know? And I thought he calmed me down. He didn't have to do that. Mm. He did not have to do that. He had a good heart. You know, he might have made some mistakes, but you know, you know, he, he, he he's, he's a change, change, change man, you know? And he, he was looking out for me and, during the riot there, like I said, everything was on fire in the middle of this, in the middle of one of the wings. Um, and he, when some of the people, when they'd got unlocked, had decided to bang themselves back up again, right? He was one of those people. And so he, there was smoke going up and in through his cell. And so I was running down and he was just banging on his door, bang, 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 saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. So I've bust his flap and he's just there like begging me, saying, please find those keys, get me out, get me out, I'm dying. Like I might get, I, I said, I've done 33 years, I can't die in here. And he, I saw like sheer terror in his eyes. Like he did not want to die in there, obviously. And um, like we managed to like stop the smoke going in, um, but we couldn't get the keys. But he was fine. He didn't die. Okay, good. In the end, but it was just things like that. Which, oh. So, how long did it, uh, did the riots go on for? Uh, not long enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't funny. Um, they went on probably like twelve hours. I'd say that's long enough. Yeah, it it went so quickly, and then in the end, uh, uh, probably longer than actually. But in the end, the um, the the tornado squad came and they had like the flashbangs mm. and they like threw f like flashbangs onto the wing and I was just like banging up mate <laughs> banged up straight away I'm not getting involved yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was just there's just a lot of craziness and then we spent about three days in our cells um, and we were just watching it all on the news like what that was happening there's like helicopters going over and were you just, scared during the riots? No, it was adrenaline, wasn't it? It's <laughs> oh, crazy. Um, nah, it was it was yeah crazy. Obviously, I didn't get involved, but I just you know it was just yeah it was yeah just a lot of adrenaline. So and then three days just banged up in the cell. Um, and eventually uh, they like I say they moved me to Oakwood. Um, I had about two weeks left of my license and then it got out mm. and then yeah so that was right at the end of 2016 so 2017 um what's the time by the way how long was um, it? half past three okay half three so those two gangs then did they cause a lot of damage to each other when yeah i think so i think i think there was yeah yeah was there <clears> any deaths any deaths yeah. <clears throat> no just that guy that was paralyzed from the waist down 
Um, what did they do to him to paralyze stabbed him? him? Oh, stabbed oh, they him just stabbed times, him and slashed him hundreds of times. Yeah. Yeah. Over, yeah. Wow. Wow. Mm. So what year did you get out? So that was, uh, I got out 30, 31st of December, 2016. So I, I was thinking like, oh, like I've got such an amazing opportunity now. Like it's the end of the year, like 2017 is a fresh start. You know, I'm going to, I was, I was completely sober by this I point. I've been smashing the gym yeah. in the, in the, in the jail. And I was actually, f I was feeling pretty good to be honest, like mentally. Um, I was still on a lot of medication and that was probably, you know, helping, but I, I, I was in a fairly good place to be honest, you know, mentally. Um, and then I came out and, um, yeah, I relapsed pretty quickly. Oh no. Yeah, I relapsed pretty mm. quickly within like a month. Did you go in a halfway house when you came out again? No, they put me in a, a two bedroom council house, just all on my own. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I relapsed pretty quick and, uh, and yeah, it kind of got, got, just got bad from there. Like I started going back to church, you know, which that was one of the things that I really missed, you know, seeing those people. Um, but I, um, I found myself in a, in a state of sort of depression and uh, addiction where I was, I was sleeping like upwards of 18 hours a day, every single day. Um, and what I was doing was I was overdosing on my prescribed medication to try and keep, like, to tranquilize myself, essentially, because I found myself in a place where being awake was just too painful, mm -hmm. you know, and, and mental health is serious, you know. Um, mental ill health, you know, the amount of people that are, are struggling at the moment, you know, and I felt very lonely, you know, but it's important, I think, for people to know that they're not alone. Um, you know, I think ultimately we 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 suffer alone, but we recover together. Um, but I was in that place, and honestly, this was probably almost like one of the probably rock bottom for me. Mm. Um, I, I just didn't have any any hope, and you know, I didn't really want to be alive anymore. And that was why I just the only thing that kept me alive was my family. You know, and the fact that they loved me, and they kept telling me that they loved me. I think it's very important that we. Don't just presume people know that they're unconditionally loved, but we actually tell tell them, like you know, because that's what kept me alive. Just knowing that my family loved me and not wanting to, not wanting to hurt them. <clears throat> and so, so that was why I just I slept because you know that was that was uh, the least painful for me. I didn't have to experience the pain of being awake, and I was like I wasn't washing. I was I wasn't washing my clothes, I, you know. I was going to the toilet in a bucket in this room. Um, you know, it was like I wasn't drinking at one Is that point. From prison? No, this was out. This is when I got no, out. No, no, but going to the toilet in a bucket is that from <clears throat> your prison? Is that it, your it prison experience? It used to it's be. kind of because you slept in a room it with might, a toilet. It might actually be. Yeah. You know? <laughs> there is. I have got a, like a genuine thing where I, I I go to the toilet like every hour now, like or maybe more sometimes. And I spoke to the doctor about it, and, and I do drink a stupid amount of water, like ridiculous amounts. But he said, "Well, the fact that you were living in a toilet for like you know a couple of years of your life, you, you've been programmed. Your mind's been programmed to think anytime you need the toilet, it's only ten feet away." Mm. And so he said that might, he said, so basically he said, I need to retrain my bladder. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, he said, he, he made it sound so easy. I was just like, yeah, like, how, how am I going to do that? But so how that, do so, you retrain your bladder? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he did go into it with me. So, but he, he said, he said, basically he said, you have to just, um, you, you just have to go, if you need the toilet, uh, yeah. You just have to hold it out, just wait it out. What, basically. like 20 minutes or something? Longer, I think. <laughs> yeah. So how did you snap out of it then and get into the school's talks? Yeah, so it was, like I said, I'd been going to this church and I went one one week and I, I decided actually I need to, I, I decided to give my life to Jesus. I realised that, I realised that I was just lost and broken, you know, and this is evident but I I really realized in that moment that I needed a savior. And so I gave my life to Jesus. And actually in that moment, I felt like my shame and all of that guilt that I'd been holding on to just vanished. Wow. And all that condemnation. And that's ultimately what, you know, 
the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, you know, he took our sin, he took our sin on him, you know, and, and that's why, you know, I, in those moments, in that moment, I realized that I've been forgiven. I truly knew that I've been forgiven of my sins. And so in that moment, I also around the same time realized that my life had gone steadily downhill after the abuse. So if that's the abuse, my life had gone dramatically downhill since then. And I'd been living below the line of power. I'd been blaming, you know, what had happened. I'd been, you know, making excuses for where my life was at based on what had happened in the past. And, you know, I'd, I ultimately was holding on to a lot of hatred and a lot of resentment and, and, and anger towards towards my abuser. And uh, I realized he had a lot of power over my life, you know? And so I knew that I had to move on. I knew that I had to forgive him if I was ever gonna get anywhere in life. Um, you know, because ultimately the unforgiveness journey looks like this. Someone hurts you, right? You hold it against them. It doesn't affect them in the slightest, but it kills you inside. <laughs> That's literally like the unforgiveness journey. And so, you know, it wasn't affecting him, but I was spending all day, every day thinking about how am I going to get him back? What am I going to do to him? How am I going to find him? And thinking about how much I hate him and how much he destroyed my life and blah, 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 blah. But that's that's not getting me anywhere. That's not helping me get move forward in life, is it? And progress. And so I forgave him. And you know, people always ask me. I, I got asked this literally today at the school. Like, how how did you forgive him? Like after what he did did to you. And I I think I think the simple answer is that I didn't in my in my own strength. You know, I, it was in 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 God's strength that I was able to forgive him. Um, and when I, when I forgave him, I said a prayer. Um, and, and honestly, I don't hold on to any bitterness towards him at all or anger anymore. Wow. wow. You know, it's the, it, it, it's, there's still aspects of it that when I talk about it, you know, it can be, it can be kind of, you know, a little bit painful, you know, emotional, but I don't hold it against him anymore. You know, That's and that, you freed yourself. Yeah. Completely freed myself. And I pray for him, you know, like what he did and what he did and you know what any pedos do is com is sick like completely sick but for me holding on to hatred on you know to him it was just destroying me you know and so it's not saying that what he did was right of course it's not um but it's just he just had so much power over my life still um you know and i love you know nelson mandela says about like unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping it's going to kill your enemies you know it's like it's so true and and from there honestly i managed to find a lot of freedom emotional freedom um and at the same time i gave up the drink and the drugs <laughs> and i went on this journey and 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 honestly pressed into jesus and you know through his power i was able to get free um and you know i'm now like half a decade sober nearly congrats yeah like yeah. and i say half a decade because it sounds better than five years right? <laughs> <laughs> but Definitely. I'm, I'm five years sober in july well done you and Brilliant. thanks i said this at school earlier i didn't get a clap and i was like doesn't that deserve a clap like, <laughs> <laughs> um but it is a, it's a big achievement because i never thought that i'd be able to get free you know do you have so much more clarity now that you are sober man like my life's been transformed like and as you say like you know that I, I really do believe that your worst day in sobriety is always going to be better than your best day in addiction like my family have the same you know i i can be the same person to my family every single day you know when when my loved ones look in my eyes they can be at peace you know because ultimately addiction is it's not just a james thing it's a james and everyone that james knows and loves uh, everyone that loves james thing it affects everyone in the family um and so yeah when they look at me in the eyes they get the same james you know every single day and it's that con consistency and that continuity and you know i was able to you know channel you know, i'm addicted to jesus now like <laughs> honestly like i you know i anywhere and everywhere I go I, I tell people what he's done for my life because some a lot of people will won't, won't believe in Jesus and that, and that's their prerogative but what you can't deny is what he's done in my life and how he's transformed my life of course and so you are absolutely glowing yeah <laughs> <laughs> what was it like going to school for the first time back in uh amazing man it was 
Were I'm, you nervous? Honestly, such... Mm, I don't think so. I, I mean, moderate, like, moderate nerves, but nothing, like, major. Um, and did it resonate to talk right away? Did they react? Yeah, they do, you know. It's... I... <laughs> you know... It's a big responsibility, I think, you know, and it's a responsibility that I don't take lightly. Um, you know, it's, it's but it's such a privilege, you know, being able to talk to them, as you'll know. Um, but they do, they, I think, yeah, as soon as you start, as soon as I start talking about like prison or whatever, you've got their attention, mm -hmm. you know. So I usually, you know, I can't remember exactly what I said earlier, but you know, something along the lines of like, you know, not, necessarily planning like outcomes too much and being in prison six years ago and not really realizing that in six years time I'd be set, stood in front of you or something along those lines and then immediately like you've got their attention yeah um and and it, it's it's amazing you know like I had a kid come up to me earlier and he just you know was shaking my hand and he said you would no idea how helpful this was he oh. said thank you James That's thank sweet. you James and I'm like, this, like this, this is what we do it for, right? Like, I just think it's beautiful that, you know, God's using my darkness from yesterday to make other people's tomorrow brighter. You know, I'm just like, that's amazing to me. How, how can schools reach out to you then to get you to do a talk? Uh, through LinkedIn, maybe. Um, contact me on LinkedIn or e they could email me, uh, james at belive.org.uk. So we'll so, put all the links in yeah. the, below this video so if yeah. people want to reach out to you to book you for talks yeah it'd be cool yeah so. are you on the socials i'm on socials a bit yeah you can uh you can plug them underneath as well definitely like follow the charity where that my charity stuff mm -hmm. um be live um and then my clothing brand everse as well oh really so yeah like, get that one quiet yeah I know. <laughs> usually like i feel like like i said usually when i talk we touch a little bit on the past and then like most of it will be like on like present and future and mm. like my ambitions and hopes but it's all cool like i think it's really important for people to understand their um that there's a story behind you know every person what, and this what is are you work. On? sorry carry on I was just—I actually went and spoke at the police force, the same, the same police force that um, they—they they weren't the ones that put me in jail, but one of the places I used to commit crime, and it was Cambridgeshire Constabulary. They, wow. And I went back. They invited me to speak to them, and I got paid. Like <laughs> I actually got paid to go and deliver a talk to the police, <laughs> and it was like honestly the most surreal experience. Mm -hmm. And when, it was on Zoom. It was on Zoom, which was a shame. But when oh. I got on, mate. Um, you know, like how you click and then it like lets you into the room and I could just see like Roku, soccer, like, and I, and my heart started, this is like, this is so nervous. My heart started beating out of my <laughs> chest and I suddenly thought I was being stitched up. <laughs> I suddenly thought, oh, they want to get me on, in here to talk. So hopefully I reveal something and then they're going to like nick me. Mm. I was so scared. But then I just thought I need to crack, I need to break the ice. I've got to break it. So I said to them, um, I, I said, I said, listen, this is quite emotional for me. I said, I said, I spent my teens getting chased by you guys. I said, you were never any good on foot. I said, it's, <laughs> I said, you was never very fast on foot. You could never catch me. But as soon as you got that chopper out, it was game over. Mm. And I just sort of cracked, you know, broke the ice. <laughs> um, but honestly, that was a crazy experience talking to the to the police. So, what are your goals? What are my goals? Mm. I guess the main thing is to um, help. I, I want, I want people. I, I hate the idea of people being hopeless. You know, I hate I, I hate the fact that on average, 19 people a, a day lose their life to suicide mm. in this country. You know, I think that's not, it's not, it's definitely not something that's spoken about enough. You know, in the fact that at least, um, you know, one in four people are, are battling with their mental health right now in this country and it's still so stigmatized. And I hate the fact that some people feel like the only option is death, you know, to mm. take their life, you know, and that, that makes me quite emotional. It makes me sad. And so I really, you know, through my, through my work and, 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 you know, I've got lots of goals, but I feel like that's got to be the main one. Like, I don't want people to die. I don't want people to, to, to feel like suicide is the only option. I don't want people to feel like they're alone. You know, I had an amazing, Ama amazing encounter with someone um, who had come across my work on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is the main the main social media platform I use and you know he'd said that before he 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 was suicidal he was at the end you know this is a, a, a businessman um, you know and he said he, he he came across my post after he'd written his suicide letters 
and he saw my post and realized in, in that moment that he wasn't alone. Wow. wow. He realized there were other people going through similar things and it gave him hope. And he started like following me, he started looking back at some of my other posts and he'd been thanking me for a couple of years, like sending me long messages, like just thanking me profusely. And I was like, I'm thinking like, why is this guy thanking me? And then what I met him a couple of weeks ago, it was, and he just said, he just said, With, if it wasn't for your life, James, I would be dead. Wow. And, and at the end he said, he said, he said, if it wasn't for you, my children wouldn't have a father. And I, and it was yeah. so emotional and it was so surreal, but it just, Gave me that motivation that I needed to, to, to keep going, to keep doing what I do. Um, you know, so I think ultimately that's my goal to be a vessel of hope. Mm. You know, whatever situation people find them in, there, there is hope. And, you know, my hope's found in Jesus. And yeah, that's what I believe. You so, are a true inspiration, yeah. don't you? Definitely, definitely so powerful, man, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Your energy, everything, the light in your eyes. Everything. Yeah. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send you a picture of me um, in 2016. And you can post it on. We'll put it in the trailer. Put it, yeah, put it right do. now. Put it in the trailer. Because yeah, there was. A, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you in a minute. But yeah, there, yeah. there was yeah. just a lot of hatred and anger in my eyes. You know. Right. Like, yeah. So, wow. if you've been enjoying this as much as we have, please let us know in the comments. All of James's links are in the description box below this video. If you're watching it on YouTube. If you want to book him for a school's talk, go down there. If you want to follow him on the socials or connect with him on LinkedIn, it's all down there. So we're looking forward to your feedback and all of Jen's stuff is down there as well. So yeah, man, brilliant. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank Let's you. Give us a hug. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, really tall down because I've got massive shoes on. Ooh. It's been good. Thanks for having oh, us. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Wow, what, what a story, man. Bless you, brother. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, being an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialized with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honor. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor.